So, uh, what I'll do is, I'll start with a very chinna history quiz. Don't get worried. It's just right or wrong. Okay, and very simple. First statement. Bharat has always been attacked by invaders. But we never attacked invading countries. So, we are such a great country. You know, we are saying, no, I think people have read my book actually. So, I think it's... So, <laughs> without further ado, definitely wrong. And why is it wrong? Okay, now, how many of you have heard of Pratihara Nagabhat? Okay, one person. How many have heard of Pratihara Ramabhadra? No people. How many have heard of Parmara Lakshmadeva? Okay, one more person. Bappa Raval? Oh, okay, cool. So, looks like people are reading some chapters of my book. <laughs> anyway, uh, to keep that aside, Pratihara Nagabhat, as per three contemporary inscriptions and manuscripts, two Arabic and one Sanskrit, launched military naval assaults on multiple ports of the Abbasid Caliphate. Zulfar, Dibba, which is in modern day UAE, Basra, which is in Iraq, and Farz, which is in Iran. Okay. His son, Ramabhadra, led this naval operation. Parmara Lakshmadev took a counter-offensive against Ghazni. He went and threatened a place called Termez, which is in Uzbekistan. Okay. And there is a Sanskrit inscription in the Central Nagpur Museum, which very in detail talks about this expedition. Bappa Rawal took a counter-offensive again against the Abbasid Caliphate. Okay. Now, all these names are invisible from our history books. Forget textbooks. I don't think for the fog of knowledge, anybody knows about Parmar Lakshmadev. Right? So, I think this is beyond left, right, center. Okay? There is a certain invisibility which is there. Let's go to the second quiz question, which hopefully people please uh, maybe forget my book, etc. But keeping aside the 20th century, Bharat and China have always been sister civilizations. We had always peaceful relations. There's a very famous WhatsApp forward which comes, you know, that India conquered China without sending a soldier. So all our sages went there. So how many people think this is right? Or is it right or wrong? No, I think I'm getting into pattern is coming very clear. Okay. So I'll again, uh, so not just firstly when I say China, uh, Firstly, when I say China, it is not the modern day China. So the great, I would say, dichotomy of history is modern day China is far larger than historic China, right? Because places like Yunnan, Tibet, Xinjiang, etc. were never historically part of China. But I'm talking about mainland China, Han China, the eastern central parts of China. We have Chinese texts from at least four different Chinese empires, which says that there was military and administrative rule of Indian dynasties over China. One more invisible name, Gadawal Govindachandra, right? I don't think anybody would have heard of him. Gadawal Govindachandra of Kannauj connected to Tamil Nadu. His sister's inscription is found in Tanjavur. But this Gadawal Govindachandra explicitly in a Prakrit text plants his flag in mainland China against the Song Emperor, right? So we'll come to that. Okay. Now, a lot of people got very afraid when I, you know, when I started telling them, see, I've got a book. The book is called Bharat's Military Conquest in Foreign Countries. So, first they said, is it about Sri Lanka, Afghanistan? I said, no, 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 I all consider them part of Bharat. They said, no, 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 is it about Southeast Asia? I said, see, it's much beyond and all. Then they got very afraid. They said, see, if you write such a book, then it will destroy our narrative that we are such a Ahimsa-loving, peaceful country. You know, our sages went and, you know, without anything, they spread their words. See, our culture is great. Civilization is great. But please try and understand, your enemy doesn't care a damn about your moral standing. He doesn't care a damn about how ahimsavadi you are. Right? He wants to destroy you. He has an existential issue with you. So irrespective of how you suppress your Shatra Dharma, he will come for you. And in fact, if you tell him that, you know, in historically I have never attacked any other invading country, he will attack you more. Because he will know that you are a weak people. You know, you cannot accept your Shatra Dharma itself 
somebody said that as hindus we should go to temple every day go to temple every day also realize all those people who sacrifice their life so that his temples are standing so our shastra dharma is very important let's not forget that peace is very important peace backed by strength is what is effective okay then something uh, our merchants and sages went to foreign lands and uh, our merchants it was very peaceful you know we we traded with mesopotamia you know our sindhu saraswati seals have been found in iraq you know we went to southeast asia we built angkor wat etc all this happened extremely peacefully i think this pattern is becoming very 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 open right so uh, we had lot of trade but our traders were protected by the shastra dharma of our chakravartis between 633 and 639 ce the rashidun caliphate the first caliphate of islamic history attacked arde hind which was an indian merchant settlement in alfa peninsula iraq they were defended that settlement was defended and the arabs were pushed back 80 kilometers by chalukya pulakeshin okay this is there in no less than four arabic records including two communications between the caliph and his generals now very easy we are in tamil nadu only after the sangam age okay i am not talking about the sangam age all the great emperors after the sangam age which tamil emperor establishes authority over south east asia very simple question okay anybody else okay anybody else wrong question all of them so it's not just one emperor in fact if you look at it explicitly in the inscriptions and also in south east asian texts we have at least five emperors three chola emperors one pallava emperor one pandyan emperor okay rajendra chola veera rajendra chola kulatunga chola nandi varman avani narayanan and jatavarman veera pandya and these are people of explicitly mentioned locations in south east asia there are many others who have said we have crossed the seas and we have done everything so importantly the entire spread of culture civilization or architecture etc was backed by strong geopolitical hard power okay let's let's not disguise that fact okay okay one question people ask if we are so brave etc why why were we invaded so often see in history i just put a cross for the continuity but in history we need to learn our lessons both from the good periods and the bad periods so in our history those chakravartis those emperors who correctly interpreted the real politic of the mahabharata the arthashastra the nitisara etc who clear, clearly interpreted what was raj dharma and what was the ram rajyam they became victorious and they became successful those kings who got into a hubris those kings who got into a huge ego and thought that they were having grand moral standing those kings lost so only if we learn both from our victories and our defeats do we exactly learn what to, to do to do now basically if we only study that we were we were defeated we were kind of you know then we'll only be demoralized if we only study that we are victorious we'll never learn the genocide and the destruction of our temples we need to learn both sides of the coin in order to chart our future path okay so basically my book talks about no less than 21 military expedition conquests all across the world by 14 indian dynasties okay and why 14 i have i have taken dynasties from all across so there is no exceptionalism it is not that only from one region they went to a particular region across the board there are right from the mediterranean sea to the pacific ocean there were different kings who uh, conquered or led expeditions to these places right now why do i say this am i saying this on the basis of what whatsapp forward social media no there are 70 inscriptions texts archaeological artifacts in 16 languages okay uh i personally and that too i would say i am i had did a very limited research but i personally refer to eight arabic texts two pahlavi texts five chinese texts five tibetan texts one tocharian text malayan javanese and obviously in, in bharatiya text you 20 25 sanskrit manuscripts there are about five tamil manuscripts multiple tamil inscriptions there are marathi records and outside there are uh, there are european texts from different periods so effectively there are 70 inscriptions archaeological sites manuscripts etc which talk about this so we don't have any dirt of information it is sheer laziness and sheer amnesia on our part that we are not studying this okay so what i'll do is there are 21 expeditions right i will only cover six 
because we have also a limitation of time and we'll try and understand why these expeditions or conquests were launched uh, basically abroad right a big issue we face right now is rising hindu phobia somebody was talking about acts in the us right we do we do have reports about desecration of let's say hindu temples in somewhere in brisbane about hindu communities attacked in canada in uk we have a pitiful institutionalized repression of hindu minorities in countries like pakistan bangladesh afghanistan and forget hindus any non abrahamic community the sd community which faced brutality at the hands of the isis right so today in this geopolitical context just pause a moment and think about this one expedition which happened about 3000 odd years ago now there is one arabic uh, a perso arabic scholar called mohammed ibn jarir al tabari okay he lived only about 1200 years ago around the 9th century in baghdad now that person wrote a book called tariq al rasul wa muluk okay that's book of generally a history of prophets and kings in the volume 2 of that book he tried to understand what was the history of the middle east before christianity so he went and met several tribes in the mediterranean region he went and he calls a region as tarshish now where the tarshish is a matter of debate right some western scholars say it's somewhere near greece somewhere near spain now the location which tabari mentions appears to be somewhere near lebanon per se but he goes and meets three tribes there you know humyun sindan and one other tribe basically and understands what was the history of middle east for christianity and around this time around 900 bc there is across the board traditions of a mighty world conqueror from bharat which he in arabic calls as zarj okay unfortunately we only have one part of a name called zarj phonetically zarj translates to zara in semitic and the original is jaya okay now we don't know is it vijaya is it jaya simha unfortunately we have only one part of a name okay what did this chakravarti jaya do so at that point of time in israel in jerusalem there was a king who came and said i don't like idol worship anybody who worships idol the guy should either convert to the god of abraham or he should be killed or banished all temples were destroyed there was huge desecration so certain tribes called benjamin and judah said that boss somebody needs to defend us all our temples are under attack so they traveled all the way to bharat they met chakravarti jaya or sarj and told him please defend us chakravarti jaya launches and tabari mentions this in great detail all the military formations you know uh, the expeditions etc launches a 100 ship navy from the western coast of bharat right up first the head of persian gulf then marches over land to the tarshish coast or somewhere in the mediterranean coast in lebanon and then very skillfully blockades and surrounds jerusalem forcing it to surrender okay so just try and understand this T- nearly 3000 years ago a chakravarti from bharat launched an military expedition 7000 kilometers away to defend an ancient idol worshiping uh, they call it a polytheistic but ultimately a sanatan allied religion and civilization from being extinct right that was the reason why such a large expedition was launched now talking about uh, basically 1400 years back now the first caliphate of islam was called the rashidun caliphate in in year 12 okay the caliph abu bakr in a letter to his general khalid bin walid writes that you know at this point of time year 12 of the islamic calendar which is about 633 uh, ce al ubula in iraq is under attack by the indians from the sea okay translated by khalid yaya translation of rc majumdar is the indian navy from the sea the indian navy from the sea so effectively in year 12 al ubula in iraq was under indian naval attack now is that the only reference here not really in year 16 we have another reference where the next caliph caliph umar says that right now i am threatened the persians have been destroyed in the battle of al qasidia so the sasanian empire which is the zoroastrian empire was nearly wiped out was facing an existential crisis because of the march of the caliphate at that point of time the caliph umar says that i am now being threatened by the shahnu shahi al hind the king of hal hind who is leading a force of the of the insurrectionists so at that time oman was in rebellion so is leading who is leading this supporting these people and is threatening and attacking the al fa peninsula 
प्लीज रिट्रीट बैक एटी किलोमीटर्स एंड सेट अप अ न्यू गैरिसन दैट गैरिसन दे कॉल्ड इट एज बासरा वन ऑफ दी प्रिंसिपल सिटीज एंड प्रिंसिपल मिडल ईस्टर्न कमर्शियल सेंटर्स टूडे हिस्टोरिकली सो वन ऑफ द ग्रेटेस्ट सिटीज ऑफ द मिडल ईस्ट इन फैक्ट ऑफ द एंटायर इस्लामिक वर्ल्ड वॉज एस्टैब्लिश्ड बिकॉज ऑफ द फियर और अ थ्रेट ऑफ द भारतीय नेवी सो जस्ट हैव अ पॉस एंड थिंक अबाउट दैट ऑब्वियसली हाउ डू वी आइडेंटिफाई द किंग बिकॉज द सेम गाय हू रेकॉर्ड द खालिफ लेटर्स also talks about the name of the shahnishah al hind about a few years ago and calls him furumisha translated as pramesha or pulakesha now pulakeshan had had a lot of biruda as a title satyashreya pulakeshan parmeshwara so that name is basically chalukya uh, so today in our history textbooks we we often study about chalukya pulakeshan as fighting against harshavardhana or fighting against pallavas you know and obviously narsimha varma pallava uh, has a vengeance and attacks the problem is we never study about the greatest achievements of the Chal- of chalukya pulakeshan which is actually fighting against the rashidun caliphate the problem I-, i would say is more fundamental why we don't study it and why do we study these aspects which i'll come to later then the pratihara raids there is a sanskrit inscription called gopadri prashasti okay this gopadri prashasti was written around uh, 815 ce you know about 1200 years back now this gopati prashasti says that this pratihara king called nagabhat was greatly devout to prabhu shri ram and he said just like shri ram crossed the ocean and def- and uh, conquered the lanka and defeated adharma similarly we are vanaras we will cross the aparanta samudra and do a lanka adhana of who's the adharma out there okay so at that same point of time 815-820 CE, we find two Arabic references: Tufail al Ayan from Oman, okay, and a Sira or Arabic letter written by an Islamic missionary in Basra in Iraq called Munir ibn Ayan, who say that we are under attack. We are being raided by the Kufra from Al Hind, okay. So at the same time, when somebody in Bharat is saying that we have crossed the Aparanta Samudra, we are actually going to strike them. as the vanaras you know as hanuman uh, you know set fire to lanka we are also going to strike so they they actually cut the supply lines at that point from the arabs went sind they were trying to advance further so Na- pratyahara nagabhat said that sama dana bheda vihina uh, ananya pratap dinamukha or sama or diplomacy dana gifts and bheda or showing discord all we are now vihin of that we no longer have any relevance for that right now the only option to be shown to the invaders ananya pratap to show our military vera and for this he attacked them in their own home to cut their supply lines consequently nagabhat was able to liberate the whole of eastern sind and substantially even the uh, kingdoms of western sind finally fell down the caliphate's authority actually ceased after a few decades Parmara Lakshman Dev. There is an inscription, Sanskrit inscription called uh, Nagpur Prashasti, which is stored in the Central Museum in Nagpur. This inscription tells us that around 900 years back, a Parmara ruler called Lakshman Dev, who is compared often to Lakshman Dev and his brother Naravarman, are compared to Ram and Bharat. So Naravarman told Lakshman Dev, "Please go ahead and fight the Turishkas because they have come. They, this Turishka, this Ghaznavi." he has desecrated so many he has desecrated so many temples please go ahead do not bother about the kingdom i will take your slippers on your throne and manage your kingdom and manage your rivals here please go ahead without fear and fight them this parmara lakshmanev crossed the khyber went to the vankshu the sanskrit shloka very clearly says on vankshu he did vyuharachna he did his military formations and wiped out the turishkas and the turishkas presented him a lot of ashwa a lot of horses as tribute and the Kira king the Kara Khani king of Uzbekistan started singing songs like a caged parrot okay this is what the sanskrit shloka says okay so effectively he was about the river oxus vankshu river oxus he was threatening his formation as such that he was threatening the key religious place of the turkish sultanates all the turkish sultanates seljuk yamini or kara khanid had a very strong religious attachment to a place called termes which was all their main theologians were there Parmara Lakshmane positioned his forces exactly near that city. 
he did not desecrate it he did not storm it but it was a psychological warfare telling them that if you could desecrate our temples we could very well reach very close to yours okay now that is parmara lakshmidev i think rajendra chola is very famous i think uh, i am actually in uh, in the right place in the right time for this but very effectively there are certain aspects how many people here know why rajendra chola launched an expedition in southeast asia why can somebody just yeah very good more effectively yeah okay very good great great uh, now aha uh -huh. fantastic very good i think both of you are uh, both of you are right and i think i should be a little garden ask my questions maybe <laughs> but uh, a little more i'll expand on that so the king of ha huh, correct so uh, all of you are right basically so there was a dynasty called the shailendra dynasty which ruled over sumatra and malaysia now what happened is they wanted to monopolize trade between the east and the west okay for establishing this monopoly they did a lot of things so like ji fong do they they kind of put to debt anybody who didn't stop or didn't trans ship in their ports okay they went to the chinese empire the song empire and told them don't give access to the ainu river to the uh, you know merchants from bharat etc you know these uh, give access only to us okay then they nationalized key products like teak teak was a very key product which was also exported from bharat right they nationalized they said only people from our malaya sumatra will be able to produce this okay so it was a very clear attack number one on economic interest but very importantly also as per the arabic writer ibn sulaiman the king of this shailendra empire in sumatra malaya started boasting that he is a chakravarti par excellence or he is a chakravarti who is far superior as per ibn sulaiman to any of the lands of hind obviously gangai kondan rajendra cholan who had expanded up till ganga the same rajendra chola who had allies like parmaras and ghadawalas of the north who was effectively the emperor of bharat could not take this lying down right so there was an attack on the political prestige there was an attack on the economic interests there was a move to cut off indian merchants from the uh, from a key market and that's why this expedition was taken this expedition covered 14 places not just sumatra malaysia but vietnam champa it covered burma it covered thailand and it was so effective it was a classic example of sea control and complete dominance for 3 years after rajendra chola's expedition there was so much of a sheer shock and awe that not a single ship not a single merchant from any single southeast asian country and there as per song empire and a chinese text even ventured out into the sea not a single embassy left sumatra malaya etc to china and the song emperor who was the emperor of china actually had to beg them please come here please come to my court please kind of cross the seas but for 3 years there was a complete still the only ships which roamed that entire south china sea the east china sea etc were the chola ships of bharat i mean that is the impact it was not a raid a lot of people say this was a raid they went and built temples this was clear sheer geopolitical control Gadawal Govinda Chandra, the invisible king, but who is one of the most greatest master statesmen and diplomats of our history. Now, Gadawal Govinda Chandra was from Kanya Gupta, Kannauj. Okay, he lived around 1114, 1115 CE, etc. Okay, now this king was a great friend of Kulatunga Chola. Okay, he was a great ally of Cholas. He, in fact, fought campaigns within Bharat in support of the Cholas. His sister. married a chola prince and her inscription is found in tanjavur very near the brihadeshwara or the big temple of raja raja her inscription is found there the same gadwala govinda chandra formed the alliance with the king of kashmir so imagine on one side with lohara dynasty of kashmir on the other hand with the parmaras with the cholas and he attacked lahore which was then the center of ghazni the ghaznavid power and occupied it for some time so just imagine this person okay forget his chinese expedition which i'll come to now just imagine this person put a diplomatic web from kashmir sharad right down to tanjavur and 
took a stand against the Ghaznavid rulers. This Gadawala Govinda Chandra, as per a text called Prakrit Pangalam, did something very interesting. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll just uh, close now. Next two slides. He made, as per this Prakrit text, the king of China, okay, the Raja of China, Darpahin. Darpahin, without all his arrogance, was smashed. Okay? And he made him run away from the runner. So he, from, he went and there was actually Hakan the pulse. So there was a complete hue and cry. And this Chinese emperor was a song emperor, had to run away from the battlefield. So why did Gadawala go to China? He was an ally of Kulatunga Chola. If you know of Chola history at that point of time, Kulatunga Chola established a lot of military bases all across the Southeast Asian and the China Sea. The Song Empire at that time, a large part of it was supporting those people who were opposing the Cholas in doing it. Gadawala Govinda Chandra as a trusted ally fought this battle with the Chinese to see that they don't intervene in this larger strategy. So a very invisible, forgotten hero of Indian history. And uh, just to conclude, you know, sometime uh, whenever I go to any such conference or when I go to any such uh, kind of event, you know, many people make a lot of statements. One statement which is made is, you know, modern Indian history writing is very Delhi centric. I say rubbish. If it was Delhi centric, then we, all of us would know of Anakpal Tomar. Anakpal Tomar re-established Indraprast. Okay. A lot of people say modern Indian history has a bias towards North India. Rubbish. If that was the case, then Gadabal, Govinda, Chandra, Parmara, Lakshma Dev would be very prominent in all our textbooks. But I will tell you what modern Indian history writing is. Modern Indian history writing is heavily biased. And in fact, I'm sorry if I may use this word, is anti-Hindu centric. Okay. It is Delhi centric when it comes to Sultanates. Okay, it is East centric when it comes to the British, it's Bombay centric when it comes to the British, but it is anti Hindu centric, or Astika, anti Astika Hindu centric, which is the great national empire before the British. How many will, people will tell you Marathas? How many people, how many people will, how many people will tell you about Guptas, Rashtrakutas, Cholas? Cholas are a Bharati empire. That's why I want to correct. I want to correct that. What will you see? We'll say Ashoka was the last great king, Chandragupta, Maurya unified Bharat, etc. But also remember what comes after that. Ashoka was a great king who converted to Buddhism after Kalinga, and that's how the peaceful era of Bharat was started. So, yes, Mauryans were great unifiers, Guptas were also great unifiers, Rashtrakutas are great unifiers, Cholas were great unifiers. When, when you start Cholas, what will you start with? Cholas were a dynasty of South India, or Cholas were a dynasty of Tamil, or Cholas were a Dravidian dynasty. Okay, whatever it is, okay. Now, now there are people who are saying Cholas are not even a Sanatan dynasty. Okay, now there are people who are saying no, Shiva Pada Shekharan Singh. There was a movie which was shown. In that in that movie, a person who got the title called Shiva Pada Shekharan was shown most more in a Buddhist monastery. I like Buddhism, but was shown more in a Buddhist monastery than doing Abhishekam to his favorite god, who is Lord Shiva. So anyway, so that is what our history is. So let us accept. Let's not get regionalized. Okay, and it is this. Same amnesia of regionalizing our Astika Hindu rulers, of breaking their vision, of telling them they are castes, they are regionalists, because that is a narrative they want to provide to us today that you are all Hindus. If you accept, you go to a temple, if you are Astikas, you don't have a vision. You are small-minded. That is precisely the reason why nobody has talked about our Shatra Dharma abroad. Nobody has talked about how our Bharat's military operations actually conquered and instilled the fear of God in several of these invaders. We need to study our weak points. We also need to be inspired because right now in the existential crisis we are fighting, we also need to have imbibe Shatta Dharma within us, not to be scared and be inspired by these different heroes. Thank you. Namaskaram and Vande Matra. I request Sri Hari Menon Ji and Sri Hari Chandran Ji to come up to the stage for the book launch. Ravi Chandran ji, I'm sorry. I also request Dr. Morelli to present the memento to Venkatesh ji.